Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I think it's time for us to get started. My name is Mark Canavera. I am one of the directors of the Care and Protection of Children, or CPC Learning Network at Columbia University. And we're just delighted to partner with the Child Protection Area of Responsibility, the International Institute for Child Rights and Development, Art Aleutian and COVID Under 19 to bring you today's webinar on Children's Voice, Maintaining and Adapting for Safe Child Participation During COVID-19. Uh, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded uh, and it will be shared afterwards, but your individual names will not be included. Um, so please do know that. Um, you, you will see on the Zoom box uh, both a chat and a Q&A function. I think most of us know these fairly well now, but um, this, please use the chat box for general conversation, but as you have questions as they arise uh, during the various presenters um, uh, presentations please put those in the Q&A and we'll be keeping an eye on those and bringing them to the presenters at the end of the webinar. It's a uh, packed two-hour agenda today. Uh, we will first hear from Michael Copeland, the coordinator of the Child Protection Area of Responsibility of the Global Protection Cluster. Uh, and then we will hear from three different sets of speakers. Uh, first, from Art Lucian, secondly, from the International Institute for Child Rights and Development, and finally, from the COVID Under-19 Project. And I will introduce each set of speakers as they come up. Uh, but first, I'm not sure if we do have Michael with speaking capacity yet. Michael Copeland, the coordinator of the Child Protection uh, Area of Responsibility, uh, a longstanding leader in the child protection and emergencies community. Um, and we're delighted to have him kick us off today. Michael, over to you. Hi, Mark. And just checking you're able to hear me okay just great and we see you as well welcome super thanks thanks so much and welcome everyone uh, good afternoon good morning good evening wherever you are thanks yeah thanks so much for taking the time and as mark said welcome to this session that forms part of the global protection cluster annual forum uh, typically we'd have many many people getting together over the years in bangkok this year we're doing that remotely, um, which allows many more of us to connect um, with many more advantages, interesting. At the outset, I want to say that whilst uh, today's session is co-hosted by CPAOR and CPC, who we're delighted um, to be with, um, the webinar is relevant uh, for all of protection on child participation and I would argue beyond. Um, so great for those of you who are joining us from child protection and also great for those of you joining us more broadly from protection and, and also other sectors. I'm just going to spend a few minutes uh, by way of background how we got to today and, and why we're here. Um, I mentioned those global forums and over the last years when we bring together child protection coordinators from across the globe, that gives us an opportunity to hear from them. What are the challenges and how can we support them better in doing their job? What we've been hearing um, is that they have been challenged around child participation. And of course, that's, that's really um, a problem because if we think about the job of coordination groups, which is to describe child protection risks, what's the situation for children, and then to set the direction for the response at an interagency level and indeed to raise funding. Not having children's voice and participation as central to that really weakens our position to do the best job possible. So we've heard over the last couple of years that at an interagency level, despite there being some great country examples, 
we're not at a systematic level of doing good participation. So some great examples here and there, but not happening systematically and not happening um, throughout the work of coordination groups. So a, a few reflections on what we've heard about why not. Um, and of course, that's going to depend on the people who are providing the services um, but and the context, the nature of the emergency. For example, is that an armed conflict um, or an emergency caused by climate change, for example. But one of the chief responses that we've heard is that there's a fear of being tokenistic in terms of participation or perhaps doing harm in our efforts to foster participation. And that despite there being so much guidance, we may not have the tools and materials that help us with the how-to, as it were. And I wonder in hearing those reflections, if somehow participation has become something extra and as such, despite having so many programs and expertise in areas that seek to understand and remedy the situation of children, for example, mental health and psychosocial support, we do not take our expertise and, and apply it to ensure that participation is part of our regular work. So maybe it's become something or seen as something extra and not integral. I also wonder and I'm struck by how our language has changed over the years. And I hear more and more references, for example, to children and adolescents or children and youth. And when we think of participation, I wonder if it reflects a growing sense or a narrative of seeing children as under 12. And in some ways, does that heighten our fear? And of course, we'll hear today and see from the materials that there are a range of options to foster participation that are age and developmentally and for the situation appropriate. And participation helps in a way remind us of the different stages and phases of childhood. As a footnote, I am concerned when I hear those references about minors. It worries me on a, on a number of levels, especially as it seems to facilitate states undertaking actions against children, which might be illegal. Anyway, that's for another bigger, separate conversation, perhaps. To participation, the benefits are so numerous from getting a better understanding of the situation gathering insights in how to design a response, getting feedback on the quality and effectiveness of the work that we do. It also helps to ground our work so we don't become too detached or abstract. I think it also gives us energy and it enriches our passion for work and working with children. I was reflecting on some examples working in border areas with South Sudan and talking with groups of children about the risks that they would see and prioritize and rank using some very old, old tools. And the examples we heard from boys about the concerns they had for their sisters being married and taken back across the border to South Sudan, or hearing from children about which parts of the program they found most useful, and least useful simply by take, placing tokens in different containers. These moments I felt brought clarity to our accountability to what was being said. In that moment, we become clearer in our accountability to those children. Of course, participation has always mattered, but as we potentially lose more contact with children, who are facing heightened risks, we need to re-examine how we ensure participation during COVID-19, which is why we're here today. In response to those concerns over the last few years and the current situation and gaps, the work that we've undertaken with partners, including the CPC in this area, has been, I think, a great example of colleagues coming together organically from a range of different backgrounds to help focus on the how-to. As we'll hear today from the great range of speakers, I want to encourage you to really get involved, make use of the materials and connect with others around your experience. 
Um, I'm really looking forward to today's session and invite you to get involved. With that, Mark, back to you and thanks so much everyone for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Michael, for those wise words. And I could not agree more about how, you know, meaningfully engaging with and allowing children to have their voice in programs just grounds them, but also then for those of us who are adults working with them brings us, like you said, energy, enthusiasm, and uh, accountability. I think it's absolutely the right word. So thank you for, for bringing that all together so nicely. We're going to start with a um, quick poll right now. This poll is going to ask you how comfortable you feel uh, incorporating children's voices in your work. Sonia, if you could please launch the poll for everyone. Just take a few seconds. It's a one question poll. Um, I see there are 127 of you and the numbers st steadily mounting. So uh, it's nice to see so many people interested in this. And we just want to get a sense of how comfortable you feel. So I'm going to count down uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one. Um, Sonia, let's see the results here. Okay, so half of you already feel very comfortable incorporating children and youth voices into your work. Uh, another third to 40% of you moderately, and then about 10% somewhere between slightly, somewhat, and not at all. So hopefully what this webinar will do for those of you who are very comfortable incorporating uh, children's and youth voices into your work is to provide you with some new ideas and tools for how to do that. So thanks for taking that poll. Uh, in terms of new tools, I'm very excited to present our first speaker today, um, Joel Bergner from the organization Artolution. And Joel is a community muralist and the CEO and co-founder of this organization. His collaborative projects for murals have spanned 12 years and 25 countries. We will, but he also has a background in um, in working with uh, youth who have faced trauma. And we will put his full biography in the chat box for you to read. Uh, in the meantime, I will turn it right over to Joel, whose work I'm sure you will be very excited to hear about. Over to you. All right, thank you so much. And thanks everyone for being here. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Joel from Artolution, and I will be talking about our programming generally around the world, as well as uh, during COVID, our COVID-specific programming. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, hopefully you can see that. If not, let me know. All right, so Artolution, we are a nonprofit organization based in New York, but we work in various parts of the world, which I'll talk about. And we focus specifically on working with vulnerable young people uh, and using the art forms uh, included in public art. So we create collaborative community arts together with a variety of different people in the community, families, children, um, artists. And uh, this is for the purpose of strengthening resilience um, and really creating a platform for young people to be able to shape their own narratives and to tell their own stories in a public space. And so this mural here brings together girls who are both Syrian refugees as well as local Jordanian girls in Amman, Jordan on the outside of a girls school. And so you can see this is kind of our, our trademark uh, style in which you can step back and see a large image, and that image was created uh, by the young people themselves. They decided on the theme, they decided on what would be the main images, but also they all got to create their own smaller works throughout the entire piece. And so in this way, everyone gets to come later and say, hey, you know, this was my part here, and that's what this means to me individually, but also as a community, we've come together to create this work of art. 
And we work in many different uh, humanitarian situations, including many refugee camps. Um, so, for example, in Zatari and Azraq refugee camps in Jordan, our biggest program is in Azraq, and this is for Syrian refugees. And so, you know, as we know, uh, many of these locations are very, there's a lot of challenges, and there is not a lot of color, as you can see from this photo here. And so what we do is bring together community members to create color, create beauty, create stories through public art. And you can see here that, you know, we bring together many different members of the community of many different ages. And we focus a lot on capacity building locally so that all of our local artists who are leading this program in the Azra camp all come from uh, Syria themselves, they are all residents of the camp themselves. And throughout these artworks, something that we really, our, our methodology really focuses on is that in each section, on each day, each workshop, the young people are exploring different themes that are important to them. So for example, on day one, the theme might be, what is your vision for the future of your community, of your life, for your family, and let's envision that through imagery. Um, maybe on day two, the theme would be, who is someone who supports you in your life? Who is a, a person who is important to you, like a teacher or a family member? And then let's learn how to create a portrait of that person in this public space. And so on. Each day we have different themes that create these platforms to explore their lives and issues that are important to them. So... An example of one of our lead teaching artists, this is Samir here, and he is from Syria. He's one of the leaders in our Azraq program. And so he is someone who fled from the war. He was uh, conscripted into the army and did not want to serve in the army because he said that he would have to kill civilians. And so he chose to flee. He was shot three times and survived as he fled. He took his wife and young children and crossed the border into Jordan and was basically in a situation as so many people are of being stuck of having nothing in his life and having this trauma that he's been dealing with however something that really inspires me about Samir and many of our lead artists is that he despite the challenges that he has faced he is someone who is giving back and has a program that he is one of the leaders of that goes all throughout the year, working with thousands of children in Azra camp, creating public arts and building healthy relationships. And so these are the kinds of local leaders, local artists that Artolution supports. And we uh, also in the Rohingya refugee camp in Bangladesh, we have a program there. And these different programs are through a variety of partners, which I'll share at the end. Um, for example, UNICEF and UNHCR are two of our big partners. And one thing that we also do is make sure that half of our artist teams are women. And so in a place like the Rohingya camps, uh, which is a very traditional society, there aren't a lot of opportunities for women to have leadership positions or even to have jobs at all. And so all of our artists are paid. These are all their, their livelihoods. This is the way they feed their families. But also this is a way for them to learn how to become community leaders. And so Rifa here, who is one of our lead artists there, she is now considered a leader in her community. And she's someone who has this opportunity to give back and to form these very important, healthy, strong, positive relationships with those in her community and the children that she serves. Now, we, we also, uh, you know, I think resilience is, is such an important thing uh, that I think the arts have a strong role to play in. And so this is a way for young people and children to say, you know, we have many labels placed on us by society and by others, and they're mostly negative labels, but we are going to create our own labels. We are going to shape our own narrative and think about what we think our identity actually is, what we want our identity to be. And we, that's a big part of the approach of Art Illusions programming. And this is something that, as we know, somebody's self-identity, somebody's narrative about their own life really can shape their future because it really determines what they think and what they feel they can do. 
Also in the South Sudanese refugee settlement of Bidi Bidi, this is in northern Uganda, we have another large program there. And so many of our artworks, this one here, it was something that the children said they wanted to explore the, the relationship between different family members, between different generations, and really this idea of creating a new community uh, because they have lost the communities where they initially came from. And so many of our artworks are, are, you know, like this one here is on the outside of a school. And so people are coming by and they are experiencing these artworks every single day in their life. And I think that's really such a powerful thing for a young person who, you know, who now has this chance to, to say, I am going to contribute to my community, not later when I'm an adult, but right now as a child, I have this opportunity to participate to contribute, to be someone who is making a difference. And people are coming by, even the adults are coming by and say, "Good, wow, this is amazing, good job. Tell me what your art is about. We always have big final uh, presentations that are public in which everyone can come by and experience that artwork and hear from the young artists themselves. These are our artists in Uganda and we bring together artists from different ethnic backgrounds. Our, our teaching artists here in Uganda are from both Uganda and South Sudan but also represent a variety of different ethnic groups in those regions and that's something I think that you know when you have a lot of tensions, when you've had conflict and, and at times violent conflict between different ethnic groups, it's so important both for the team of teaching artists as well as the children that we work with to represent many different groups and come together in a common mission to create these works of art. In Colombia, we work with both Venezuelans that have come in in recent years, as well as internally displaced Colombians and those affected by the conflict in Colombia. And so this is one of our murals. It's in Agua Blanca, which is in Cali. And this was one that the youth said, you know, we're not even able to walk a couple blocks down because we have these invisible borders, as we call them. And you can be killed, you can be robbed simply for crossing into another faction's territory. And so this mural was an exploration of that idea of how can we break down these barriers? How can we come together in unity and you see that the children created many small characters throughout the larger faces. And those all represent the various people from the diversity of groups that live in that community. Now beyond mural arts, we also have other art forms that we lead and this would include photography and film. We also do what's called a program called the Foundstruments Soundstruments. And what this is, is that we create community sculptures in which the young people take garbage, trash, you know, repurposed objects and turn them into a sculpture. So all these objects on this mural here are all different uh, trash that had been thrown out and that they repurposed. And each one is also a percussion instrument. So you can come and actually play this sculpture with drumsticks. Another important program for us is performance. And so we have both dance and theatrical performances. This one, once again, this is still in Colombia, in Agua Blanca. And in this community, just like the murals, the young people are the ones who are deciding what their performance will be about, what the story will be about, and what are the themes that are really important to them. So this one is about the violence in the community and it has a strong message near the end of the, of the production about the peace that they would like to build in their community. We do also work in the United States and we work a lot with uh, asylum seekers and other young people who have experienced trauma uh, and who are vulnerable. So this mural uh, in New York, which was created by asylum seekers. Uh, this was one, you see there's all these little characters throughout the mural. And this is one where we brought in augmented reality and using animation to bring some of these characters to life. So this character, for example, I, I, I just love kids art and I love the stories that the, that the youth come up with for these characters. So this one was by a girl named Christelle and she's from Honduras, she's 14 years old and she said, my character is a baby 
but my baby is a thousand years old. And when she was, when she first was born, she was born of demon parents who didn't love her. And that's why you see these wings on her back. But she rejected that. And she said, I, I do care about love and I want love and I want to spread love. And so she went throughout the world and had this magical baby rattle, which she would use to spread love and peace throughout the world. And if you see, you can use a device such as a cell phone. And when you walk up to the mural, you will actually see the animation that Christelle came up with for her character. So this mix of technology and community art has really brought us to the, our current Virtual Bridges program, which has really taken off, especially during the COVID era. And so this is something where we bring together young people, uh, young artists as well, from different countries. And this is, I think, just beyond COVID, also, I think it's just amazing, you know, to just see them interact with each other, learn about young people like themselves in other cultures and other social contexts, but who have gone through some of the same uh, challenges in life. So we, we guide them through the creation of characters, like the one that I just described. This is a big fundamental part of our Virtual Bridges program. They learn how to use different characteristics. You know, what is the origin story of your character? Uh, what is the superpower and the weakness of your character? All is a way to explore, uh, you know, not only fiction, this is fiction, but it's a way to explore some real topics as well. And I think that's one of the great things about creating characters is that you can explore real things that might be difficult to actually talk about, but explore them through play and through creativity. So this is an example of a drawing and then a digital work of art. We also teach digital art, and so they can explore their characters through that. They can explore their characters as well through 2D animation. So they learn how to do their own simple animation. And we create collaborative works. And so this is a, uh, a work that was created with youth in India, Mauritius, and Brazil. They were all teenage girls who had experienced homelessness and who had experienced the, the street life. And all of them came together with these characters and created this collage. And this is another collage created by youth in Uganda, Italy, and the United States. And it's just, I think, so interesting to see all the different styles and all of it coming together within one piece. And these are the participants that created that piece there. And something that we do with them as well is storytelling. So this is just a sample slide of our presentation that we do with them, where they learn about what is a setting, what is a protagonist, what is a narrative arc, what is a plot, you know, all the fundamentals of storytelling, and they actually learn to tell a story together. So each member of the group goes around and they each tell a different part of the story. And at the end, they have created one collaborative story. And then, we take those stories and the young participants create different works of art. For example, a comic book that explores their story. Also, for both stories as well as the characters, they create 3D versions using clay. And so in this way, they start thinking about how to create uh, 3D worlds and then how to animate those worlds. So this one, this is the one, uh, the group from India, Mauritius, and Brazil, the girls who had lived on the street, they actually created their own collaborative animation work. So this features the clay animation created by the girls in three different countries who never met in real life, don't speak the same language, but yet have be able, be, been able to come together and create this animation piece together. And then at the end, we always have a big public celebration, in this case, a virtual public celebration where people can come and hear from the youth themselves and see their works. Another way that we explore these characters is through masks and through costume making, through performance. And so they can take their characters and explore them through these different mediums and actually embody their character through these costumes. This is that, that same group of young girls I was talking about, and this is their costumes and their masks that they've created. And they made a collaborative video where they are all interacting with one another uh, through the use of a soccer ball or football. 
So you can see that they have made this video where it appears that they're each throwing the football from one to the other. They get to dance, they get to express themselves, they get to kick it uh, from one to the other. And at the end, they have this final work where they, it really symbolizes how they've come together. And lastly, we are also exploring virtual reality art making as a way for young people to first learn about technology, but also to be able to connect in virtual spaces. And I think all of these different ways of connecting is something that um, promotes social inclusion. These are young people who obviously feel excluded, they feel isolated, especially during time, the time of COVID. And so this is a way for them to, to come together and feel included. And so this project here, this was uh, one example of that with young people in Colombia and in Brooklyn, New York, all vulnerable youth and coming together. This was actually right before COVID started. So that's why you're seeing them actually, uh, you know, together in person. But they have learned to create virtual art together. And so this was a very, very, you know, really fun and fascinating experience for them to learn about each other and to create art together. And lastly, I just want to say thank you so much to all of our partners. This work with Artolution, you know, it's only made possible because we partner with some really incredible humanitarian organizations and foundations around the world for our different programs. And you can find out more on our website, which is artolution.org. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing now. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Joe. We already have a couple of questions that have come in for you, but we'll punt those to the end. But it's just, um, I kept having a smile on my face watching this. It's so nice to see um, color and creativity. Um, and I, as you were talking, all I could think about was if, if we were doing this from a highly technical child protection point of view, uh, we would be reducing all of this to very boring terms like protective factors and risk factors and psychosocial support. <laughs> so just to hear you describe this in, in very um, plain and straightforward language, but that really cre uh, conveys the creativity was, was really a joy. I also loved how you, you know, noted that the art making is in, has intrinsic value in and of itself, uh, and also can be a great conversation starter between children themselves, and especially between children and adults in their community who then are, um, you know, encouraged to ask them about what they're drawing. And the last thing is that I've been in discussion with child development experts recently, and this notion of helping children to think of their superpowers is something that really can have some strong psychosocial support. So all of those examples were just um, really inspiring, and, and thank you so much for, for bringing them to us. Um, we are going to turn now to um, uh, the International Institute for Child Rights and Development, which has been developing a set of tips and tools for uh, safely and ethically engaging children uh, during COVID-19, and especially trying to frame that guidance in a way that helps uh, those of us working with children and youth to dive into, um, in, to, to move through examples and small activities into deeper and more meaningful partnerships. Uh, the people, this is work that the Child Protection Area of Responsibility um, came to us at the beginning of COVID-19 and said our partners are having uh, real difficulty just reaching out to children. How can we get some ideas and tools into their hands fairly quickly? Um, I think the world has evolved in many ways, but we are still in the early days of this pandemic, sadly, and, and are also hopeful that the tools which will be coming soon will still be useful. The two that we'll be hearing from are um, Laura Wright, who is the Director of Participatory Methodologies at IICRD, uh, and Vanessa Curry, the Executive Director. You can read their full biographies in the chat box. 
Uh, and with no further ado, I'm just delighted to present uh, Laura and Vanessa. Over to you. Thanks so much, Mark, uh, for the kind introduction. We're really happy to be here with you today to introduce the guide moving towards children as partners in child protection in COVID-19. Um, as Mark said, we'll be speaking with you today from IICRD. And we would like to uh, start by acknowledging our co-authors, um, Yana Mayaskaya, uh, Helen Beach, both of who are on the call as well today, the webinar today, and Lindsay Rogers. Of course, Mark, to yourself for all the support and guidance as we have moved through. So to give you just a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today, um, we are going to start by looking at ISCRD and then move into talking about some of the objectives of the guide, an overview of the modules of the guide so you get a sense of how it works, key concepts that um, are the underpinning of the guide, and then move into talking about some creative strategies for working with children as partners in child protection during COVID-19. Um, including sharing a sample tool or two, and then we'll move through to next steps. So just to tell you a bit about IICRD, we're a Canadian charity, a small Canadian charity that really believes that by leading with children, we can transform the world. Um, we focus on art and play and nature-based activities in our work, ensuring that everything we do between adults, children, and elders is all in collaboration. And we feel that, you know, there's no other way really to, to move and address the challenges that we're than by really working through this deep collaboration. Global relationships are central to this work, um, as well as intergenerational partnerships. So we're happy to be able to share um, the guide with you today. So as Mark was referencing at the beginning of COVID, um, our colleague Lindsay Rogers spent quite a bit of time reviewing hundreds and hundreds of documents that were coming out very, very quickly from organizations about how children were being engaged during child protection um, in COVID-19. And really what we found was a, a real gap in, um, in practical tips and tools. So this is where the guide itself uh, has come from is, you know, it's in an effort to provide practical guidance for humanitarian actors so that they can, or you can strengthen children's meaningful participation in your work. Um, the guide itself is uh, structured into tips and tools. Um, this includes rapid tools, so tools that you can implement quite quickly in five to 30 minutes with groups of children, as well as longer, deeper tools um, that span from 30 minutes to an hour and a half, where you can really look at how you're beginning to engage in partnerships with young people. Mark likes to describe this gu guide as a bit of um, an iceberg, where we're thinking about how we're moving a little bit more deep participation and, and partnership with children. So the guide itself is an invitation to move towards intergenerational taps into what children, adults, and elders all know about how we can respond and address um, young people's needs uh, during the pandemic. So I'll hand it over to my colleague, Laura, to walk you through the modules. Hey, thanks, Vanessa. So as Vanessa was mentioning, it kind of starts um, right into some rapid tools with a decision tree process to support people to look at different approaches to be able to engage young people meaningfully. And we walk through five modules. Um, so we're looking at adapting participatory tools during COVID um, with ways to look at remote possibilities, safe distance practices that are still fun and engaging, as well as online um, adaptations. And then our second piece looks at rapid engagement of children in COVID-19. So this looks at some of the quick tools that you can use that are still meaningful and effective um, when there's a short moment of time to engage with young people. Um, then we move to ethics and safeguarding, which is central for all aspects of the resource. Um, and we focus in on child-centered safeguarding and um, relational ethics processes. We're then looking at meaningful child participation in COVID-19. So what does this really look like? Um, 
what are ways that we can do this effectively and partner with young people. And then the last module really gets deeper. It starts to look at moving from children as partner participants to children as partners. And how can we deeply and critically reflect on the ways that we engage with young people, the ways that we've experienced that in our own childhood of leadership or lack of leadership, um, and the ways that this impacts our interactions um, with young people and our organizational process. So uh, to get us moving and reflecting for poll one, we'd like everyone to think back to when you were a child and how did you feel that you were meaningfully involved by adults in your school or community? Um, please check all that apply. Um, and if Sonia Yanya, you can pop up, that would be lovely. Great, so we'll allow people to do this as we continue to move through and then we'll look at um, your reflections of the poll. Because I'm, sh there we are, lovely, thank you. So you can look as many as you would like. Great, so as you're engaging in the pool, um, just to further look at children as partners and some key concepts. So as um, the majority of you emphasized, you're very familiar with engaging young people. These definitions are, are probably quite common to you, but just to reinforce the, that we're looking here at child participation as the Committee on the Rights of the Child. So an ongoing process which includes information sharing and dialogue between children and adults based on mutual respect. Um, and just to flag here, we have got people who've highlighted, you know, sort of 55% their ideas were listened to. We have half meaningful roles, um, much more felt supported to be creative, which is really exciting to see. Um, and then less or so around their opinions being taken into consideration and being supported. So I think it's important for us all to reflect on how these life experiences affect the way that we support young people to engage, maybe we become more passionate or the, internalized forms of youth oppression from our childhoods that then may negatively impede the ways that we support young people to engage with our own lives. Um, so to just go back to our definitions, and we're also looking at the Lundy model, which supports space, voice, audience, and influence. And these are all critical factors for effective, quality, meaningful participation. Um, we've introduced in this resource uh, a, a new Approach called the bamboo approach and this really builds on intergenerational relationships and partnerships. So this is moving to children as partners. When we speak of bamboo we recognize bamboo is a rhizomatic um, construction and so that therefore it grows underneath the ground horizontally in multiple directions without one direct starting point or one significant hierarchy. Yet all the bamboo can grow up independently and thrive but it's all interconnected. Um, similar to the way we look at partnerships with young people and adults, we recognize it as a horizontal partnership, that things can start from young people, start from adults, and there's different ways to engage in relations. It's not a hierarchical process, it's something where young people and adults are working together in partnership to foster something new and creative, innovative, um, that supports all to thrive within the space. So moving back to Vanessa, who will start to walk through the key components uh, of this resource. Thanks, Laura. So we wanted to share some of the um, key components or key ideas behind working with children as partners in protection during COVID-19. So the first circle you can see there, the yellow circles, talks about safe environments. And what we have seen is that as challenges increase, so does our natural protectionist culture, which is totally understandable. As things get difficult, we really want to provide protection for the young people in our lives and the ones that we work with. Um, but often child protection supersedes children's ability to participate, their right to participate in things that are important for them. What we know is that children can be engaged and involved safely, um, and their involvement leads to often better programs and better outcomes for children themselves. One of the concepts that's introduced in the guide is around child-centered safeguarding, um, and our colleague Helen is on the call today if anyone has questions about that. Um, this is her concept, which is a wonderful one that comes from feminist uh, writings on safeguarding. 
And the idea of um, child-centered safeguarding is that we are working in collaboration with young people to prevent harm involving children in understanding uh, and responding uh, to risk and safety planning. Um, we're enabling children to play a role in their own safeguarding, recognizing they know um, what's going on in their own lives and they can play a central role in decision making. So this first circle is really about ensuring that safety comes first, but that it doesn't prevent us from meaningfully engaging young people in the work that we're doing. The second circle is around support. So this is the fun one. It's really about amplifying child-led actions, providing support and opportunities for young people to be um, involved, but also to take the lead on things that are important to them. Um, in many ways, adults really need to get out of the way so that young people can lead. And so this is really about us, as Laura was saying, reflecting on what we can do as practitioners to support young people, whether that's um, sharing resources, sharing connections, brainstorming ideas um, that supports young people to lead and to, to show the way. In the, the final circle, sustain. We're looking here at how do we establish meaningful relationships and many of the tools in the guide really draw on our based methodologies. Um, as Joel was saying, because these are the things that really connect us to our own humanity and enable us to meaningfully connect with other people around us, whether that's children or adults, we all connect best when we're playing and exploring and, and being creative. And it's a really great way to, to form relationships and to solidify relationships. Um, but what's important here is that we're able to, to move from um, together forward into opportunities for co-learning and co-action. So we're going to move into another poll here. Thanks, Sonia. So we'll just ask you to think about um, children have, have children partnered with your organization in activities or projects during COVID-19? And you can click uh, yes, no, or I don't know, or not applicable. So we just take a moment to share your thoughts here about what's going on uh, in your organization during COVID. While you're doing that, I can move on to the next slide. Just to talk through now some of the tools. Oh, we have the, the poll already. Okay, so yes, children are being engaged. 61% of people said that children are engaged and that's really amazing. 15% um, are, are not applicable. That's great, it's super interesting to hear what's going on out there. <laughs> So back to the tools. So within the guide, the guide's really focused around guidance, but also practical tools that you can use. And when we were thinking and exploring and reading about the different contexts in which COVID-19 is taking place, we realized that we needed to have a large gamut of different types of methods of tools that could be used um, within various settings and at different times, uh, depending on what was taking place with COVID-19. So the first is in-person or in-person socially distanced tools. All of the tools in the guide have an option for this. Online engagement. We know that not everyone and not all young people have access to the internet via but for those that do, um, we have um, included options from in Zoom, social media, and collaborative whiteboard spaces. Um, we've also included some SMS surveys, um, ensuring that data is provided back to young people. So again, that they can be in charge of, of the information. Um, radio call-in shows, community poster boards, community art installations, and home delivered packages. Um, adapting methodologies within uh, the tools in the guide that you can use. Of course, always ensuring that safety precautions are in place um, and those will differ um, in each community um, that you're in. So to start, we'll just tell you a little bit about some of the rapid tools that are included in the guide. So the rapid tools are tools 
that uh, for those of you who have a little bit more difficulty engaging with young people, whether because of COVID-19 or different crisis um, that, are, that are, the community is experiencing. So these tools are shorter. They're anywhere from five to 20 minutes, which means they're really accessible. They're very easy to use. And the guide itself will explain a step-by-step -step process to walk you through the facilitation of each of these tools. So to give you an example of one of them, in head, heart, and hands, this is where you can really try to understand how children are thinking and feeling and what they're keen to be engaged in. Um, in Rosebud and Thorn, this can be used as an evaluation or just a way to identify strengths, uh, challenges, and potential areas of growth in child protection programs uh, in COVID. So all of these tools, um, are written and developed in a way for you to be able to apply them right away in your communities uh, with um, adjustments for various age and uh, disability as well. Back to you, Laura. Great, thanks Vanessa. So the next section, um, this looks at some of the deeper tools. And so these come out in module four and module five. The first is around working with children. So some of these you may be familiar with, like child protection community mapping, vision collages, object stories, and looking at the most significant change processes. Um, but we, we've adapted these as well so that there's options to do them remotely um, from being an online process or sending packages to young people's homes where internet connectivity is a challenge or ideas to be able to send data so that young people can be active as well as in-person ways that you can adapt these activities for safe distancing um, depending on your country context uh, and other creative formats. I think thinking back to some of Joel's comments, there's ways that young people can engage with or without words um, collectively on these pieces. The critical reflection activities for adults come out in the last module, and this explores reflecting on our own identities and experiences in working in partnership with children. So what does that mean and look like based on our lived experiences, our organizational approaches, and how can we shift ourselves um, and really have that transformation to effectively work in partnership with young people. There's a power sharing tool as well. This tool is an acting scenario to look at different power relationships, children and adults um, in a process. Um, and how can we reflect on what those mean for us? Uh, as Michael highlighted in the very beginning, we want to create spaces for participation to become integral to our practice, not as an extra or an add-on, so to really be able to critically reflect. An example of one of our activities is object stories. So this activity invites young people and adults to take objects, um, they may be nature, art, play-based, and this can be outdoors, this could be in the home, if it's online, and to use an object to um, explain and explore what does safety and wellness mean to someone um, and sit in a circle process and share back as a collective. Um, this can be used in different aspects of a humanitarian program life cycle, um, as you can see here, or in, in many different formats. Um, and we recommend this activity for ages four to 18, it can be adapted, it suggests 30 minutes, but as any tool when we're working in partnership with young people, always build an extra time um, to allow for those conversations to emerge. Um, so there's one example uh, for you all. Now moving forward, we've seen some questions pop up in the chat um, that are looking at, can we have access to this resource? So thank you, that's wonderful that people are interested. The resource is gonna be launched October to November. It's in the process of, with a creative designer, so making it interactive and user-friendly uh, for you all to be able to take forward. And we'll share that link out with all the participants who signed up um, and you can be able to share with others to be able to use. It's also going to be piloted, piloted across a few countries. Um, and so let us know if anyone's interested. Um, this can be done in different ways to get feedback as well um, and to build a community of practice. So we'd love to see a community of practice forming in an online space where people can share learnings and ideas and reflections on how they're engaging young people meaningfully in um, these current times of COVID and in protection spaces. As many as, of us have seen um, within COVID that the protectionist culture has, has enhanced. Um, people are 
looking at child protection more than children's participation quite often. And the right for participation is not being accessed or supported in the same way. And yet we have many people who are galvanizing to effectively engage young people as partners. So we wanna build on that energy and create a community of practice to continue to learn and share. Um, just to really highlight with the resource, there's also an annotated bibliography and a Dropbox of relevant files that have been introduced during COVID that people have created or once prior. There's many tools that you know, existed prior to the pandemic that are still applicable and can be adapted and modified effectively. Um, and then there'll be a spotlight series, and I won't steal Yana's thunder because she's going to share that in more detail later on, but it's quite an exciting piece um, to really continue to learn um, from young people around the world. So thank you all. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, we'll have Q&A, but you can also always reach out to Vanessa and I. Um, we're always happy to chat and share ideas together um, or check out the website, Twitter or Facebook. So we'll pass it back to Mark who will introduce the last um, exciting session for today. Thank you so much, Vanessa and Lauren. Again, we have lots of comments and questions coming in already. So I'm glad that people are, are interested by this including a recent comment that it's great to see the emphasis on intergenerational partnerships and I think as much as we can conceptualize child participation as a set of activities um, what you are leading us to do is to really think about um, the power sharing that adults will need to learn how to do and of course it's never um, it doesn't feel good for those who hold power to be giving it away. And so I think we're often resistant to do so. And we are, as adults, inherently more powerful than children. So uh, part of that journey of getting us to be willing to allow children to make decisions um, is, is going to be an ongoing process. But I do think of this COVID-19 moment as one when um, we have an opportunity like we haven't had in a very long time to do so. So despite all of the pain, uh, the, the jolt to the world is something that we can, um, can look to and think about and, and feel to help ourselves be better um, practitioners who work in partnership with children. So thank you for highlighting that. And we also have some, some more questions about the bamboo approach that we'll get to at the end. We're at the hour mark, and I know this is when webinar uh, attention tends to just start its slow decline <laughs> into, uh, into um, oblivion. So I want to make sure that we're attentive for our last set of presenters, and then I'm sure we'll have a lively Q&A. So if you're able to stand where you are, just stand up, give your legs a little bit of room and just kind of lean one direction, lean another, and then shake it out. And I hope we're all back together now. I'll have a seat and, and introduce our last presenters here, who are um, Kristen Hope and Konstantinos Papachistou. Uh, Kristen Hope has been working in research and advocacy for children's rights for over a decade. You can read her biography in the chat. And Konstantinos is studying politics and international affairs at the University of Warwick and is the founder of Greece's first online think tank for teenagers, Teens for Greece. Uh, and I would love to hear from you, Konstantinos, how you say Teens for Greece in Greek. Uh, thank you so much for coming to share the COVID Under-19 initiative with us, which really was one of the earliest pieces to start moving as the pandemic spread around the world. So we're really excited to see how it's evolved several months later. Over to you, Kristen and Konstantinos. Thank you so much, Mark. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can, can everyone see my presentation? Yep. Super. Okay. So, hello, I'm Kristin Muntaldizam. I'm glad to be here today. 
Hi, and uh, my name is Konstantinos, and uh, I'm also from COVID-19, and I'm so glad to be here. And I would also like to start from something that Laura said, actually, and it really reminded me of something that uh, my grandfather used to say, and it's the bamboo approach, but my father had a different word for it. So he basically said that a good parent is one that will plant the tree that will provide the shade for the grandchildren. And I think that's something that resonates with uh, the work of COVID-19 and the idea of responsibility, especially for the future and especially in the times we're currently living in. I think that COVID-19 is definitely a generational issue. I mean, in a way, it, it's changed the way we see things. It changes everything, the way we live, the way we work, the way we communicate, and the way we even meet our friends and family. I know that... I, you can ask ourselves, especially those that grew up in the past decades, or the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, how did you see your future back then? You, you possibly saw it in a positive way, but I think that's not the case currently for this generation, especially with climate change and COVID currently threatening our future. And the thing is, we still haven't seen the full effects of it. Only in 2020, 1.6 billion children around the world were affected by school disruptions. Well, an additional, additional 23.8 million children may drop out or not have access to school next year due to the pandemic's economic impact. In reality, the coronavirus has halted the progress we made in human rights and may take us back to square one. The necessary lockdown measures may lead to an unprecedented economic crisis that may even result to a lost generation. According to the World Bank, in their more optimistic report, COVID-19 will push an, an extra 71 million people into extreme poverty. And, th and we still haven't seen the full effects of it. And I think the group that is, that will be more affected by it is children, especially they have to live with the consequences of it. Currently, a, a lot of them have missed school, a lot of them have missed education, a lot of them might even have um, seen their haven't seen their friends or their family for months. And it's definitely a scary time and a very uncertain time. And now we're discussing about the post-COVID world, about the new educational measures, the new uh, way we live our lives. But children are not consulted, especially as they'll be the ones that will live this life. And I think it's definitely wrong. Children should be consulted, especially in matters that directly affect them. For example, education or uh, universities. It's something that children haven't been consulted, really. I mean, politics in general, we've made a, a lot of mistakes as humans because we assume things. A lot of politicians assume what children might need for education. They assume what they might need for the environment. They assume what they might need for, uh, for their future, but they were never asked directly. And I think that's what we're trying with, to change with COVID-19. So um, please, the next slide. So in reality, what COVID-19 is, it's an initiative that aims to unite children and adults from all over, all over the world and combine them together with governments, with NGOs, with the third sector to create the post-COVID world that will reflect what children truly want. It's, it's an initiative for children, but also with children. Children have also been involved with other, throughout the design and have also worked closely with COVID-19. And we've also worked with different policymakers, professionals, and even governments. I think that's one of the key points of COVID-19, that we are, in a way, a living example of how we can work with children, governments, and everyone else, NGOs, um, the third sector, schools even. And now I'll pass the microphone to Kristen to explain more about um, the process and different phases of the initiative. Thanks so much, Konstantinos, and thank you for that really powerful introduction, because I think that as much as we can also theorize about where we are right now, I think, at, at least listening to you, um, it, it reminds us that this is still a very, um, it, you know, it, this is a, a lived reality that we're all sharing in different ways, and obviously COVID does impact us all in different ways, but it's still very much a, a visceral reality that we confront, and therefore um, part of that is also like, and what do we do with this reality? You know, how do we 
how do we try to deliver on some of our promises to children? And so, um, as 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 uh, Constantina said, we um, we got together um, as a group of organisations, NGOs, UN agencies, child-led organisations, local and international organisations. Actually, you can see the list of partners here. So, um, and academics as well. So, um, um, uh, um, um, really, a huge group of of um, individuals putting and and groups um, and organisations putting their heads together. Um, trying to think about what can we do together to make sure that children's right to be heard is upheld during the pandemic and in responses to the pandemic. Um, so you know, myself working at Saldezum, um, we reached out across our network um, and, um, uh, and really brought together this incredible group of organizations, of coalitions, of, of again, of academics um, and UN agencies. We've had incredible support from uh, Najat Malamjid, the United Nations um, Special representative to the Secretary General on Violence Against Children, um, and um, uh, and her team, and she's and, and again, it's incredible to have um, the support that um, that can ensure that whatever's coming out of this initiative is also that states are at the are listening as well. And, and, and similarly, um, our lead academic partner, Queen's University Belfast, has played a crucial role in ensuring that academic rigor is upheld in, in all of the components of the initiative. And then we have, you know, incredible amount of, you know, other partners, including you know, IICRD, who's here on the call with us today. And local organizations, others, and of course, Teens for World, which is um, Constantino's organization. So, really, a, a, a big alliance um, to, to, to really take this work forward. Um, I, um, I wanted to share today a little bit about, you know, what have we done in COVID-19 and also how child participation has taken shape at each phase. Because really, as, 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 as Constantino said, what we've tried to do with this initiative is really to make sure that children um, and, and younger people like Constantinos are really involved at each different step. Um, so, so what has that looked like for us? Um, you can, um, for example, look at the different phases of the um, initiative. So as early in April, we got together with um, the partners and essentially we decided that it would be very important to uh, try to capture children's experiences of the pandemic. Um, and then in order to, that, to do that, we wanted to devise and uh, design a survey um, in order to ask children about their experiences. But we also, we, we wanted to do that with children. So. Um, um, so we, we, we asked children, we asked children, you know, what would you like to ask other children? Um, and we integrated those responses into our, um, our formulation of the survey. Um, and, um, and we also, um, we did um, integrate, you know, we piloted the language of the survey as well with children. And we also, um, you know, really use that to hone in on specific questions, um, you know, reflecting on um, the ethical guidance that we all adhere to around, you know, upholding do no harm as a principle of research when we're doing research with children. But um, we really wanted to make sure that we were, um, you know, um, adhering to this. And, and so we, 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 we did that by, um, by piloting the language of different questions with children and asking them to, to, to let us know, you know, does, is this uh, the way of asking this question triggering for you or, you know, how does it make you feel or do you have any suggestions about the way we can modify the language? And this was particularly done, for example, around questions uh, pertaining to safety and violence, because on one hand, we, we, you know, it's important to understand, you know, how children are experiencing this moment um, in terms of, you know, their exposure to violence in an online or an offline environment. But at the same time, we need to ask the questions in a way that don't do harm. And so part of the solution was going back to children and asking them to engage with us about that. And that was very, um, a very fruitful process. Um, and we also had um, um, young people, so like Constantinos, who's 18, and some of his peers involved in our actual steering groups. And so Constantinos um, uh, is coordinating uh, the communications work, and he will speak about that a little bit. Um, uh, but he's also managing um, the social media channels of the initiative, um, and there's been, um, and he, he will talk about that as well. So, so when it came to then rolling out the survey um, globally. Um, we, um, we, we ensured that also children could be involved, um, but th throughout the whole while that they had the support of the organizations that they were working with to ensure things like confidentiality and um, inf um, informed consent were being upheld as well, because obviously we never want to, we, we, we will not compromise on the, the ethical provisions. Um, and then so, so that was over the summer, we, 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 we rolled out the survey and currently we're in phase three, which is, um, which is a process of, um, 
um, analyzing all of the data. So um, I'll talk about this in a bit, but we received 26,000 responses of children aged eight to 17 years old. And it was, it's an incredible um, quantity of data, but also it's, um, it's very unique because we are now um, involving children in making meaning of that data, you know, um, of, of interpreting that. And in order to do that, we're building their skills in, in uh, qualitative and quantitative data analysis. Um, we're also building their skills in um, different areas. So, um, so uh, in related to communications, um, so for example, in blogging or related to advocacy, how to design advocacy messages, because at the end of this, the objective um, is that, you know, um, children who've been involved in this initiative um, can also, um, you know, that their participation supports them in their own ambition in terms of child rights advocacy in their own environment. Um, so we're running virtual camps, global virtual camps currently. Well, we have about 85 children from across the world registered, and these are being run in English and um, with Spanish interpretation um, and, um, you know, to build children's skills in these areas. Um, and the, 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 the process is, the, you know, the, object, the, the result of all this process is that next month in October, we will be disseminating and launching the results of the, the survey. Um, so um, you, hopefully all of you who are on this call will receive a, you know, a little bit more information about that when, when we've got things nailed down. But essentially what we wanted to show you is that the whole, um, through every step of the way we've been um, involving children um, and trying to do that in a way that is, um, is based on their own um, expectations of what involvement in global advocacy can mean and how it reinforces their roles. Um, at local or national level. Um, so for example, just a few examples of how we've been doing this. I did speak about this, you know, when we were designing the survey, we asked children, you know, question A, that, you know, we asked children, if you had to ask other children about how they're feeling about their lives right now, what would you be asking them? What questions would you be asking other children? And so we integrated um, those, the answers to some of those questions. In this phase, it was 207 children from 26 countries and we integrated those answers with other kind of you know expert answers and and um and the rights based methodology that we were using to design the survey similarly um and this is a photograph of laura wright who has just given an excellent presentation um laura uh, conducted uh, last week um, a session with children on how to analyze qualitative data so she was talking about you know using child-friendly techniques for you know coding and um clustering responses and again children will take that methodology and then apply it to the qualitative data that we have collected uh, during the survey um, so that they so that when we are sharing the, the results that we're also sharing children's meanings and not just adult meanings um, and so yes I did speak about the survey but just to recap we it was um, you know an online survey in 28 languages plus an easy read version for children with disabilities um, but what was also very important about the methodology is that because we were very mindful of the digital divide and we're very mindful of the ways in which the pandemic has exacerbated existing inequalities and so we also provided a facilitators pack for frontline uh, protection workers such as psychologists or social workers who are you know we're continuing to um, you know adapt to their new realities of lockdown or of confinement but still trying to provide services for ch to children whether it was remotely or whether it was you know in a in a face-to-face -face environment but with social distancing um, we you know supported them to be able to also administer the survey so that we made sure that you know internet access wasn't a, um, a, a you know a, a barrier in in, in, in accessing the, the survey. And, um, and yes, it is, it, it is to date the largest global survey of children's exper experiences during COVID. So it's, it, you know, quantitatively it's, 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 it's unique, but it's also qualitatively unique because it is the only survey that was designed with children, that's being analyzed with children. Um, and, um, and it uses a rights-based methodology. So it's looking at how children experience their rights during the pandemic. Um, and um, and looking at this children's experiences, plus um, there we've asked children, you know, what would you like to tell governments about about what what should be done differently? Um, and then just another point to mention is that we've tried as much as possible with the, the wide range of partners that we've been working with to um, to ensure that there are linkages with existing research projects, so such as the Global Kids Online project, which some of you might be familiar with, and also a new project which is about to launch, which is called the COVID 4P Log, which is being led by 
the University of Strathclyde and Pathfinders initiative, which is basically trying to roll out a, um, an app for child protection workers, um, um, multi, well, also um, different people working in the fields of um, policy and practice related to children. So it's quite, it is actually multi-sectoral. It's not just protection. It also includes education um, and health. But the idea is to capture, um, you know, uh, practitioners and policymakers experiences of decision making in the pandemic and what we're doing is we are um, also you know um, feeding back through the app children's experiences of the pandemic that we've gathered through the survey in order to create that sort of dialogue um, so so it's all quite exciting and that's again what the the, the beauty of having you know such an incredible group of partners um, enables us to, to think about how we can strategically um, uh, uh, channel the findings uh, to have most impact so Constantinos You've been involved in this. Um, what's it meant for you? How's it? Yeah, well, I would love to hear from you about your involvement, your reflections. Yeah, thank you very much. I think COVID-19 definitely has been great, especially that there are many things that I definitely agree with. I mean, me personally, I'm a great believer in uh, stories and uh, human interaction. Um, and I know that's one thing we've been doing with COVID-19, especially with the survey. Um, for example, if you go on our social media page, and the Christian mentioned that we're doing uh, the communications work, we have a lot of stories from uh, anonymous children that have posted statements about um, the way they've experienced the pandemic, and I think that's so powerful. For example, I have a 14-year-old girl from Zambia who said, I feel the need to work more on the right to education. Seeing that I live in a rural community, as it is hard to access internet, and it's definitely a challenge to learn online. And I think that's something we have to look uh, I mean, sorry, I meant, uh, yeah, and it, it's definitely great to see how different um, children, although they may be facing definitely severe con consequences, they're getting, in a way, more willing to change things. And they're getting more, they realize the power of their voice. And I think that may be something positive we get out of COVID-19, and especially as uh, the digital age uh, continues. I know currently it's very difficult um, to, I mean, in developing countries, actually, below 50% of the population have access to internet. And that's something definitely to work on. And especially now with education that is online, it may be a struggle for a lot of people, especially even in the US. I was reading all the years that a lot of children don't have access to education, they're not able to attend their online classes. And these inequalities are very deepening, especially now with the economic consequence of COVID. And COVID 19 is so broad in its, um, in its idea. Because as we said, we have different phases starting from the survey where we're trying to look at how different children have experienced across the globe because COVID-19 has been so different in different countries. For example, um, in the UK, a child might have experienced differently from a child in Zambia or another country. And I think that's something great because we look at stories, we look at individuals, and we look at most importantly experiences. Um, something important that I got out of COVID-19 is that they truly believe in, they truly believe in child participation. And I've been involved in other initiatives, even in my country, the uh, Greek Youth Parliament. Um, I mean, it's great as an idea to have a youth parliament, but usually it's just in a way like a checklist. They do it just to show that we're doing child participation. And, and it was just a five-day conference. I think child participation should be a lot more than that. It should be effective and it should be a continuous process. And it should both involve adults and children. It should be about international partnership. It shouldn't be seen like a two opposite sides. It should be two sides working together and children and adults as we both live the future together. And I think children definitely have a transformative power. We've seen recently the news, um, the climate change um, activists. We've also seen the Black Lives Matter movement in the US and across the globe that were mainly led by young people and children. And we're definitely seeing a new movement of young people who are, um, who are seeing, who are becoming more politically active and have a voice and I think that's a great opportunity for more initiatives for more countries for more governments to involve young people because we truly should especially as they have the solutions even for some issues and even for education they have first-hand experience of how they've experienced education how they're experiencing um, the changing circumstances but in terms of what I've enjoyed mostly about COVID-19 is speaking to people from all around the world and cha changing my perspective about things and understanding better about the effects that it has on people and individuals, on communities. And I think that's something we can get out of COVID-19. COVID 
uh, it's about the changing circumstance, the changing stories, and mostly how we are connected as humans and what truly connects us. I mean, if you, June and May, we, I was watching the news every day. It was a very hard time for me, especially, and I think most people, psychologists were, were in a very good state. My mental health was definitely not in a good state. We'd go on the news and Facebook, and every day would be, we'd live like, I don't know, like it seemed like a reality show. They would count the number of deaths and we discuss this as if it was like the Hunger Games. And I think it's, it's way more than data and numbers. People's lives shouldn't be measured every day in deaths. We should share stories with share individuals. And I think that inspires change, that inspires the people, and that inspires the next generation that will move the human race forward. And yeah, no, COVID, definitely. I think it's definitely devastating what well, has come what has come because of COVID-19, but I also think it can also be a good opportunity to reflect on the past mistakes, but also reflect on what we can do better. We can trust science, we can listen to the right people, and we can work together for a better future that will involve everyone, not just a few people. So that's how I felt about COVID under 19. Thanks, Constantinos. And again, it's so it's such a privilege, I think, for, well, for, I speak personally, but also on behalf of the initiative to be working with such engaged children and young people like yourself who also locate this participation within, you know, within a broader, I guess, philosophy and a broader vision about, well, what can our world become? You know, what do we what do we build together out of the ashes of COVID? Um, and so, you know, from there, um, I'd just like to, um, you know, start to wrap up by saying, um, you know, some of the main points that we would like um, you participants um, in, in cyberspace <laughs> to take away today is about, you know, um, you know, rights-based ethical child participation, particularly here we're talking about research and advocacy, but that can also be in your operations. It is possible, even during a global pandemic. And actually, even before when Constantinos and I were, re <laughs> were rehearsing, he said, especially during a global pandemic. Um, and it, it's true, you know, if, if not now, then when? Um, it's, of course, an end in itself. We are upholding children's right to be heard, um, as, as, as is enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but it's also a means to an end. This is an opportunity for us to start shifting power towards some of those intergenerational partnerships that Laura and Vanessa and others have been speaking about. And so I think that, you know, this, this at least from, I think it begs some questions to adults to ask themselves, you know, what has prevented us from enabling children to play greater roles? What has enabled, what has prevented us from letting go of some of the power? Um, do we understand children's motivations and ambitions to be involved in participatory initiatives? And if we do, then how does this inform what our approach is? What do we change when we talk to children and we learn from them? You know, how are we changing as well? How is this a dialogical you know, process of transformation? Um, and, and for our experiences, you know, um, putting you know, you know, this kind of partnership into practice, it requires integrating children and young people into the decision making. Um, so integrating them into the working groups, into the coordination structures, into you know, whatever it is, the architecture or of, of, of this initiative, you know, let's, Let's make sure that children and young people are involved and at the table. Um, um, let's make sure that we're cultivating spaces for exchanges and connections with other children. Let's make sure that there are these peer connections because these are also incredibly, um, incredibly just, just positive. There are positive thing there are positive moments in as Constantinos was saying in a in a in a in a, in a, in a world which is in, in a in a context which is you know where I think we're overwhelmed by the negative stories and or you know whether it's on the media or whether it's our own you know grappling with our own personal experiences of of the pandemic and so you know we need to stay connected connection is actually what is going to to enable us to get out of this um and so it's the more that we can open up the experiences for connections between children so that they can share with each other that they can learn from each other they can build together the better we are going to be and the stronger we're going to be and that in that process it also is about thinking about how we can build their skills to also become you know more resilient or empowered or also you know agents of change in their own right um, and we as adult allies are there to support them and um, and also there to ensure that duty bearers are, are holding true on their promises that they have made in accordance with international law and so um, 
you know, what can you do when you leave here? Constantinos, what are we asking them to do? Yeah, please um, follow our social media channels. They're actually run by young people and even the logo has been designed uh, by a young person. So please follow our Facebook, which is, um, as you can see, COVID-19. Our Twitter and our also Instagram with their same name. Um, please, if you have any, uh, any ideas, please message us. We're free to discuss anything. Um, and please share everything if uh, you like it. Yeah, and let us know if you have any participatory activities or initiatives in your countries that you are looking to seek to, you know, amplify or to connect, because it's also that, it's that process of, you know, what can be, how can we, um, um, you know, invigorate processes by, you know, connecting globally. And then also part of what we're also trying to do with the global is then thinking how it filters back down to the local. How is it that we can also replicate some of the, the methodologies at global level, um, at local level too. So um, please, please, connect and um, we look forward to, um, to moving this forward with you and sharing the results in October. Thank you so much for having us today. Thank you, Kristen and Konstantinos. Um, Konstantinos, as you spoke, I just constantly found myself nodding my head. What a voice of wisdom you are. And I just really appreciated, you know, some of the key points that you reminded us of, the, the need to challenge assumptions and not, well not to assume in the first place but to actually ask children what they are living through um, and also when you said people should not be measured every day amen and I say that as a researcher and your focus on the importance of stories in in helping us to understand people's realities was um, really really appreciated and Kristen to hear you start your wrap-up with you can ethically and safely engage children during this time period, I think is a um, much needed counterbalance to much of the guidance that we're seeing come out that is telling people don't proceed with data collection, data collection if you think of it in that sense. And um, I tend to fall on the other side of the fence that actually we will be doing poor programs uh, that are not adapted to need if we're not doing what we can uh, to to hear from and to centralize uh, what children are telling us. So, so thank you both. Um, we are heading into the last half hour, which is uh, thankfully a big Q&A. And so we've got a lot of questions that are coming in already. Um, and it may be interesting to go to gallery view for all of you who are participants here, which should give you a a view of many of the people who have their cams on, uh, the, the panelists. Um, so the button at the top right. And the Q&A will be led by um, a beloved member of the Global Child Protection Community, Lauren Biankowski, who is the Global Help Desk focal point for the child protection area of responsibility. And Lauren has 13 years of experience. We'll, we'll put her bio in the chat box. And with that, over to you, Lauren. You're muted. Well, there we go. <laughs> there was going to be, there was bound to be something. Um, but anyway, yes, great presentations, um, everyone, and thank you so much. But we do want to utilize this time um, and get right into the questions. So um, there, for those of you who um, want to check out, there have been some answered questions already. Um, but we had a first question from Fatuma um, about, you know, great information coming in from the different art forms. Um, but Joel and others, if you want to pop in as well, um, if you could let us know how you use that information to design programs or to influence programs. Great, thanks. Yeah, thanks Fatuma for that question. Um, so what we have is, is a system in which we have uh, many of our teaching artists who are the facilitators of the programs are youth themselves and we have a mentorship program in which the older teaching artists can then, uh, you know, work with the younger ones in order to, uh, you know, teach best practices about how to work with, with children. Um, and so 
what we do is also is making sure that we are really engaging youth who are already active in their community. And I think this is a really big part of it because you have someone like, for example, uh, we have one youth whose name is Kevin Ramirez and he's in Agua Blanca, the community that I showed during my presentation in Colombia, in Cali. And so this is a community that has had extreme violence and conflict. And what Kevin is doing as a, a teenager um, he's currently 18. He's been doing this since he was about 15, where he leads dance programs in his community. And he's been doing that for free. Um, he, he gets out there. He's passionate about it. It's something that he has become a leader in his community and known for this. And so what we've done is we've recognized that. And so we said, you know, Kevin, you're going to, uh, you know, we'd like to give you an opportunity to, to work with us, to le do what you're doing, um, share this knowledge with others, also learn information from others who are doing this as well. And so we had a whole program, a uh, capacity building program that he participated in. And now he is leading those programs. And now this is a job for him uh, through the funding that we've been able to get for his program. And he is during COVID, we have a new, a new structure for his program in which he goes out into a field, people wear masks and the youth all spread out. Um, Cause I know that was another question. How are we doing this during COVID? Um, you know, spreading out social distancing and continuing to have those dance and performance based workshops with Kevin. And so, um, so that's something that's, that I think uh, we really focus on to make sure that we have the youth who, who are already leaders in their community have that platform, be able to make a career out of it, and really reach many more youth. Um, and in terms of COVID, keeping everyone safe, both by social distancing and by leading the online virtual workshops that I uh, showed in my presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Joel. Um, Vanessa, Laura, did you want to jump in as well? Yeah, so thanks so much, Joel. It's really exciting to hear more from your program. Um, and within the guide as well, there's ways to, lots of the tools are structured so they can be adapted, but there's also specific guidance on how some may be used in needs assessment and designing a program and really using the art and play approaches to effectively engage in partnership with young people to support how your programs may shape or form. Um, and then there's other ways too that pieces could be adapted and modified so that you're engaging kind of an action research process with young people um, so that they're informing and shaping the programs um, within the organization. Vanessa, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. All right. Well, thank you so much um, to you both for answering that question. Um, Fatuma, feel free to reach out in case um, you'd like more information. Um, Joel, you already touched on a question around how did we adapt um, for COVID? Um, and Laura and Vanessa, you also presented um, on various options, SMS, um, and doing things online and, and how to adapt for in-person. Um, where that is possible. Um, anything else anyone wants to add on how you um, adapted for the COVID-19 situation and ensuring the physical safety and health of children? Um, I, I will say one thing about the COVID response is that, you know, the most important thing is to keep all the participants, everyone involved safe. And so I think you know, like I said, the two main ways of doing that is being able to be socially distanced outdoors as well as using technology to meet virtually. But I also wanted to say that this is a, an opportunity, I think. I mean, for, for many of our youth, you know, for example, leading uh, projects online with girls who have lived on the streets in Chennai, India, this was the first time that they had ever even used, uh, you know, Zoom, had used many of the online platforms we were using um, and doing animation, you know, all of these things were, were new to them. So in a way through, because of the restrictions of COVID, we also really wanna look at that as an opportunity um, to learn new things, to learn new skills, to, to open people up to things that they didn't have access to before. And so I think, you know, as, as terrible as COVID is, that's, that's the way that we try to look at it to find those new opportunities. Great. Could I also just jump in really quickly with also a kind of a different anecdote, kind of the going back, uh, but, um, but uh, one of the, the when we were um, in the process of trying to roll out the survey, and as I said, one of the, one of the things that we were trying to ensure was that um, 
frontline practitioners were able to administer the survey for children who didn't have an internet access. So a particular cohort of children that we work with in our programming is Dalism, are as children deprived of liberty, so children who may be in prison or children who may be in closed institutions. Um, and what was very interesting about that also is that um, when we were, um, and, and, and that is working with social workers and psychologists who, who are working in those institutions every day, and what was very interesting also, you know, in the context of COVID, that even the work in the maintaining access to those institutions was also about um, uh, we were able to um, um, the, the, the governments in, in some countries um, were requesting also that they could have access better access to um, basic protective PPE protective gear masks gloves and, and hand sanitizer so actually as part of our sort of you know you know general pro or continuing our general programming but also in order to reinforce the participation of children who you know were say deprived of liberty we were also um, you know um, ensuring the provision of of, um, of PPE to um, to you know institutions and um, uh, where um, which actually you know raises the general level of sanitation for the the, the whole population of children. So I think it, it can go both ways. It can be as Joel was saying, it's you no know, access to technology, but it can also be about how through our you know um, accessing different actors who are present with children, can we also leverage that to promote you know hygiene practices for children that keeps everyone safe. Great point. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, and so we've talked a lot about, you know, the physical safety and health of children. Um, but also, I think, you know, Joel, this was a great point raised by um, Deanna, that about how are we making sure that they're, um, that the children are kept safe emotionally, and mentally um, during this. So I'll, we'll start off with Joel, but then if others want to come in um, on some child safeguarding practices and ensuring the mental health. Yeah, well, I think, you know, for us, uh, one thing is to make sure that we're always working with our local partners on the ground, um, those who have, uh, you know, who are in psychosocial support and other, other uh, fields that really have an expertise in this and having them lead uh, workshops. So, for example, our team in the Azraq refugee camps, we, we partner with UNICEF there. And so we've been able to have child safeguarding uh, workshops led by UNICEF for our staff. Um, because we know that we are experts in collaborative art making in vulnerable communities, but we're not experts in everything, and we're not experts necessarily in um, something like psychosocial support or, or child safeguarding. So we make sure that all of our team members are then being trained in those things. Um, and also, you know, through the programs, I think it's really important, for example, when we're exploring different themes in the community to to talk about you know what are your what is your vision for the future for example you know what are your your dreams and not saying something like uh you know our our, our teaching artists are instructed not to ask questions like you know what you know what happened to you in the country that you came from why did you have to come over to why did you end up in this refugee camp or, you know, all those types of questions they know hey if the youth want to come up to you as a facilitator and share that information if it's something they want to discuss which they often do that's up to them um, but it should definitely be on their terms um, when they build those healthy relationships and when they feel safe to do so with certain individuals and not something that you would just bring up with the group so that's just one example of the many different kind of guidelines that we have to make sure that children are feeling safe in these environments Wonderful. Thanks, Joel. Um, Helen, do you want to come in as well? Um, you've done quite a bit on child safeguarding. Yeah, I mean, uh, Joel said it already, in, in, but we have kind of put it in the terms of relational safety. Uh, so this is about um, not being a professional counselor, psychologist or anything like that, but developing relational safety with uh, the children that you're working with. So that's kind of developing a warm, trusting, positive, stable relationship that children can turn to. And it may well be that it's, um, it's other kind of older street educators or uh, art leaders that become that, that person for children. And we are encouraging people to, to think about relational safety um, because everyone's banging on about physical safety and the, can the uh, you know, disease prevention, but actually for, for a lot of children, uh, the, the mental, their mental welfare 
um, is very contingent on relational state, uh, safety and uh, the relationships that they develop and that they're stable and consistent um, and that, that they can help each, each other through this difficult time. So that's one thing we have focused on uh, in terms of looking at child-centered safeguarding. Great, thanks Helen. Um, we also have two questions getting a little bit more into some of the nitty gritty, um, but around logistics. So just around the technology um, for kids during COVID. Um, and then also the next question on, um, you know, how do you, how many children should you engage? How many, how much time do you need to prepare? Um, or opportunities or challenges identified in reaching vulnerable uh, communities. So um, I will hand this question over to Joel again to start as the first question was for you, um, but then others, please feel free to jump in. Great. Um, yeah, so what, what I love about the question, there's, there's always this question of how do you get this expensive technology to refugee camps or to vulnerable communities and what's what what i find interesting about that is actually these virtual programs are much more affordable than our usual programs because the cost of uh, you know some of these devices for example the stop motion animation that we do is all on you know any smartphone it doesn't have to be a very super advanced one or any kind of tablet um, and so what we do is we identify specific people so in the uh, for example, in the uh, Center for Street Youth in Chennai in India, um, we had certain staff members who had access to those things. And so all of the youth would take turns using those devices that they had. Um, and so even the virtual reality headsets that we use in Columbia and, and in Brooklyn um, with those programs that we'd like to spread to other places, those are only $400 each. So for the price of paint for a big mural program, you can buy two or three headsets. And unlike the mural, it actually lasts much longer, right? It's not just one project, you can continue using those. So, so some of this technology actually isn't as expensive as, as it may appear. Um, the bigger is issue for us has been internet access for in, in remote areas, and that's been really challenging. And so what we've done is just, you know, we've talked to different tech companies, we've looked at all different kinds of options. And what we've noticed is two things. Number one is that there's a big difference between do, do people not have access because they can't afford it, or do people not have access because it's not available in their area? Often it's because they can't afford it. And then we can solve that problem because that can be part of the program, that can be part of the budget, and we can actually send data plans directly to the devices. So if there's a person with a smartphone that's gonna be working with a certain number of uh, participants and you know, we can send that person um, you know, the data package. And so that's way, the way we can solve that. In other locations, we, you know, even if you send them in internet packages, they still can't get good reception. And so in that case, we've had to look into, can we bring a modem? Like in the Bitty Bitty Refugee Settlement, we've brought in modems from the capital, Kampala, um, that get much, much better uh, internet reception than people's phones do. Um, and so just in that particular environment, that was the thing that worked. And so we just, we try different things. We, we, you know, and in everywhere that we've worked, we found at least one solution um, to this issue. Great, thanks. That was really useful and practical um, feedback. Um, I also wanted to see if Laura and Vanessa um, or Kristen or Constantine want to come in on some of the um, other logistical issues raised by uh, Sean. Um. Sure, I can start and then uh, hand it over to others to add in. Um, thanks for that question, Sean, because I think um, logistical challenges are, are very real and we all are wondering all the time how we're going to manage programs, how we're going to get funding. Um, and it is more difficult to get funding um, typically for participation programs than it is for protection. But hopefully the more conversations that we have, these kinds of things will begin to change. For every single activity, we give um, the preparatory time that will take for facilitators, as well as the time it'll take to conduct the activity. But I would say for every participatory activity, your planning and your follow-up is about double the time of the activity itself. So if you are planning a one hour activity, know that you'll probably spend at least an hour preparing and an hour 
um, in terms of follow up, um, just to, to wrap things up. So we always want to make sure with donors that we're very upfront about the time that it takes. I would also say like to Helen's point around relational safety and building, building these long term relationships with young people. This takes time. It's not something that is normally factored into um, humanitarian budgets. And so if we can start to think about what does it mean to have someone who's continuously engaged with a group of young people over a period of time and have that person to have the time and ability to respond to young people's needs. Because if we begin to start thinking about shifting power away from only adult run programs and adult led initiatives to things that are shared, it takes a lot more time because you're looking at working in partnership. Even if we look at working in partnership with other adults, we know that it takes more time, but we know that the outcome is always so much better and can really you know, look to address young people's needs so much better. So we hope that some of the answers that you have, the specific answers around logistics um, will be included to, in, the, in the guide, but I'll turn it over to Laura in case I missed anything there. No, that, that's wonderful. Um, and in that addition to, as, as Vanessa mentioned, it's, uh, other parts are in the guide and there's some parts logistically that you know, we, we recommend from the guide to follow local guidelines as um, the question around numbers of participants and pieces. We, we have general recommendations and we know every context is different. Some have six people, some have bubbles, some have larger groups. So um, we respect the wisdom of the people using the resource to work locally to identify um, what makes sense for um, meaningful partnerships and safety with young people. Great. Thanks so much, uh, Laura and Vanessa. We just have one last question um, before we start to wrap up here. And this is a question for Constantine and Kristen, um, but others, again, can jump in. Um, how did you reach out to the children? So you reached so many children. Um, and I think you touched on this a little bit during your presentation. But um, if you could give us another uh, description of how you reached out. Um, I mean, I'll start and then hand over to Konstantinos. But um, I mean, the basic, um, the starting point was reaching out to all of the partners. Um, so of all of those, you know, 30 plus partner organizations, including international, local NGOs, working with children with existing programming, um, was really sort of, you know, reaching those networks. But then another big um, component was the social media component. So Konstantinos, I don't know if you want to speak a little bit more about that and about what kind of some of the strategies were, the thinking was about that and about starting the, our own channel actually Constantinus was very um, adamant from the beginning that we needed our own kind of standalone channels so I don't know if you want to talk about that Constantinus. Yeah yeah sure uh, yeah definitely the partners were very helpful I also think that um, social media is a great way to reach out to many children um, especially between the age group of 13 to 18 because I think that's um, the main group that is using social media. Um, I mean in terms of uh, COVID-19 it was a bit surprising, especially our Facebook page. Uh, only on the month of July, we had a two million, um, engage, two million people engagement and actually visiting our page. This was uh, quite um, surprising. It's, it's a very big number. I mean, I think that children have such a big need to express what they're feeling or what they're experiencing that if some, if they look at something or if they see something on their page or visit it or if something seems interesting, but also it's a matter of making it um, child friendly. And the best way to do, do it more child friendly is to involve young people and children in the communication process or throughout the organization, um, especially for example, with Instagram, with the way it works and uh, the algorithm, the way that you cannot post on only what you have to use an image as well. That's also quite useful and maybe even the colors you have to use. I mean, in terms of us, initially we used also videos of different children that were, um, helping with COVID-19 but also others as well because I think definitely videos are very helpful also about sharing, sharing stories but also about uh, connecting a face to something um, especially for a younger ages that's, that's very important. Great thanks so much Konstantinos and Kristen um, really useful so uh, we have reached the end of the, the Q&A. Thanks so much to everyone for great questions um, and then to all of the panelists for your responses. Um, really useful information. 
So now we are going to head into um, a final evaluation. We'll do a quick evaluation of how you found the webinar, how you found the information. Um, and then uh, Mark will do a quick wrap up for us. Uh, and we'll also share some information of where you can go for if you have further questions. So Mark and Sonia, I'm going to hand over to you. Great, thank you. Um, we see the link for the evaluation there and we managed to keep 70 of you here for almost two hours, which is a minor miracle. Um, or you can also see the link in the chat box. Apologies, my cam was off. Um, so this is just a two question or three question evaluation. Shouldn't take you more than a couple of minutes to fill out. Um, meanwhile, uh, we have the slide there with some of the links for the Global Protection Cluster and the Child Protection Area of Responsibility. So that website that you see there is the website at the top right is the website for the overall Global Protection Cluster uh, Forum, the Global Protection Forum this year. There are still, I think, a few events to come. It's been going on for a while now. You can check out the schedule there. Um, and if you have more questions about today's webinar, there are the email addresses of the folks you can reach out to, Lauren and our behind the scenes producer, Yana, whom you did not hear from, but who was like the man behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz doing lots of little things to make things keep running. So, um, you know, the, you know, just in closing, I realize we've had you for a very long time here, but um, the, I just feel very inspired. We, you know, six months ago felt very powerless, not only because of uh, COVID-19's expansion and the way that it changed our lives, but we were all wondering how to engage uh, children and how to reach out to them. And it's just very heartening to see how far we've come and to see the way that these di different initiatives are either emerging or adapting or taking shape. Um, it is uh, really especially lovely to hear so many creative approaches because uh, one thing we in the global humanitarian community are not great at is being creative. So even though we might struggle to get our minds around how collective art making may be linked to our protection work, I think it's really worth the effort to think about it because this really creative methods are obviously the way that children are going to feel excited and um, have lots of ideas to share. So it's really, it's especially exciting to see those. Um, I don't want to keep this any longer than we need to, and I'm glad that we finished before our two-hour mark. Please do fill out the survey, and we will be sending around the recording uh, probably next week. It will also be put up on the um, Global Protection Cluster and the Child Protection Area of Responsibility websites. Um, so with no further ado, a big thank you to, I'm probably going to forget someone here, but let's see if I can remember. We've got Sonia and Yana who are helping to run the show. And then also we had Michael Copeland from the Child Protection Area of Responsibility, uh, Joel Bergner from Art Illusion, uh, Vanessa Curry and Lauren Biankowski, I'm sorry, Vanessa Curry and Laura Wright from uh, the International Institute for Child Rights and Development. Uh, Kristen Hope from Terre des Hommes and COVID Under 19 and Konstantinos Papachistou uh, from the same initiative. And finally, Lauren Biankowski wrapping us up with the Q&A. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the day or evening wherever you are. Bye everyone. Thank you, Mark. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.